It is a huge, unbelievable honor today to be podcast interviewing absolutely probably the most famous dentist on earth. Uh, Dr. William Dorfman, Bill Dorfman, uh, is most recognizable as the leading celebrity cosmetic dentist from the ABC hit show Extreme Makeover and is also a recurring guest co-host on the Emmy-winning daytime show The Doctors. Best known for making America smile, Dr. Bill has also transformed the smiles of celebrities such as Usher, Anthony Hopkins, Nia Long, Jessica Simpson, Nisi, Nisi Nash, Britney Spears, Ozzy and Sharon Osbourne, and the cast of Desperate Housewives, among many others. He is also a New York Times bestselling author for his latest book, Billion Dollar Smile, for which 100% of the proceeds are donated to children's charity, and was recently included in the Guinness's Book of World Records for his philanthropic efforts. Beyond being known as America's Dentist, Dr. Dorfman is an entrepreneur and founder of Zoom, Day White, Night White, and Breath RX, not only selling his company to Philips, but also being featured nationally and internationally as a smile export. More than a dentist, Dr. Dorfman is an author, entrepreneur, philanthropist, TV personality, health and fitness enthusiastic, and father of uh, three adorable girls, right? You have three girls? Yes. And, and I got to tell you, you know, you, you are such a sweetheart. When I didn't know how to do anything, I actually went down to your office uh, in, uh, cross, it's what, across from Beverly Hills in Century City? That's right. And uh, I asked you if I could come observe you. You let me in. You let me ask 14 million stupid questions. And I mean, yeah, so I got to see the man in action. And you are a legend from A to Z. Thank you so much for spending an hour with me today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So is it? I is it? Seen you in years, Howard. Has it been years? Yeah, yeah, years. Huh. I think the last time I saw you was at the uh, Planet Hollywood. Huh. Yeah. We're 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 getting older, man. Gosh darn, we're getting older. My, no, my, you're getting older. <laughs> my, my my boys are uh, 21, 23, 25, and twenty seven. How old are your three girls now? Uh, 23, 18, and 18. So the, so, uh, and so are the twins identical? Are they, uh, no, no, they're not, but they just graduated, uh, yesterday and it was beautiful. Yeah, that is, uh, did you cry? No. Oh, yeah. you liar. You cry. You shed at least one tear. No, I really didn't. Really? No, it was a really joyous event. They both got into great schools. Uh, Charlie's going to USC, which kind of kills me because I'm a Bruin. But uh, Georgie's going to Syracuse, and uh, no, I'm really proud of him. It was beautiful. So, um, Bill, um, what made you, when did you first know that you were going to focus on cosmetic dentistry? I mean, you went all the way to the very top of, co I mean, there, there's no one more cosmetic dentist than you. In fact, other dentists in other countries uh, um, credit you with, there's a dentist in uh, Portugal who, when he was a big fan of your show, he started one in Lisbon, Portugal. Are you aware of that? Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are so, several people. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've heard other dentists trying to be like you in dozens of different countries in Africa, Asia, Europe. Um, when did you first know that you were going to uh, be a cosmetic dentist? You know, I mean, I love dentistry from the get go, but even in dental school and, you know, you, you get so excited because you know, they teach you how to save a tooth, you know, and it's like, you know, you feel like king of the world, like I saved that tooth. I, but then I realized that when you save a lot of teeth, then you save a smile. And when you save a smile, you save a life. And it's so much bigger, you know? And I, I mean, it, it, things in my life happened. It was kind of like a perfect storm in, in a good direction, you know? Discus Dental was thriving. My practice was thriving. I mean, a lot of things were firing all at the same time. And when the opportunity for Extreme Makeover came, reality TV had really just started. And the jury was still out on whether this was going to be a good thing or a bad thing, you know. And at first, I was a little reluctant to actually even do that show. Um, you know, after several meetings with the creator of the show, the, the late Howard Schultz, and, and not Starbucks Howard Schultz, but Howard Schultz of Extreme Makeover, um, I realized that these people really had their heart in the right place and they really wanted to help people. And so I signed on for the show and I had no idea 
what kind of impact that would make. You know, I mean, it literally changed the face of dentistry because you got to face it, for years, we were the brunt of everything bad on TV and movies. I mean, W.C. Fields, Marathon Mad, you know, Little Shop of Horrors. I mean, dentists were never highlighted in a very positive note. Even Jennifer Anderson. Yeah, I mean, all those shows, you know. And so for the first time ever on primetime TV, I got a chance to show the world all the great things that dentistry could do. And, and you know, these people, they, they, they got nipped and tucked. And I mean, they went through the ringer, you know, and at the end of the day, there may have been criticism by people on, oh, you know, she shouldn't have done that. And da, da, da. nobody, nobody ever said they should still have bad teeth. You know? <laughs> Nobody ever said that. And, and when you sat down and you talked to these patients and you said, you know, what made the biggest difference to you a across the board? They all said their smile, their teeth. Okay, one lady said her breasts, but she had great teeth, Howard. And so, you know, she already started off with good teeth. But other than that, they all said their teeth. It's huge. I mean, it's amazing. You can meet the poorest of the poorest girl on earth and say, I'll give you $100,000 if I can pull your front tooth and you can never replace it. And they turn around and run. I mean, yeah. nobody, nobody will separate with their teeth. Unless they're from Ireland. Unless they're from Ireland. And it was knocked out in a brawl. Ah. No, it's funny. My, one of my patients is, is a big agent at, at CAA. And she's Irish. And she went home. And she hasn't been home in 20 years. And she saw her best friend Mary. Right before she left, Mary fell and knocked out her two front teeth. Hilda saw Mary and said, Mary, you still don't have teeth? She said, Hilda, I'm Mary. <laughs> so like, what do I need them for, right? I, I shouldn't say this, I'll get in trouble, but you know, when you go to Europe and you meet a, a lady, you know, my age, you know, I'm 53, um, in England and Germany, you know, they've, uh, they, they pretty much have, uh, how should I say this, I'm being rude. They don't care. And uh, the, only, the only women who are still rock, trying to rock it and rocking it well in their 60s, 70s is Paris. Have you noticed that? The French women, they could be uh -huh. 80 years old and they're still wearing lipstick, well, Chanel number no. 5. Yeah, right, but not their teeth. I mean, until they smile. It's, you know, I practiced in Europe. French dentists are the only ones that can actually clean somebody's teeth. There are no hygienists there. And a dentist doesn't really want to sit there and do profies. They want to do crowns. So you don't get the best, you know, dental care. I, 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 I remember one time I was lecturing in London for the uh, Royal College of Dentists, whatever, and I took my boy with me. Uh, it was Greg. And uh, we were standing out in front of this amazing hotel, and this green Lamborghini shows up. And this girl gets out, and I mean, just, she, just gorgeous. And she had an evening-length, like, silk gown that matched her Lamborghini. And Greg and I are tapping, they're like, holy moly. And she gets out, and she walks up, and right when she walked by, she said hello, and she smiled. And she was missing a lateral. We're like, how do you buy a $100,000 Lamborghini and a $10,000 dress and you're missing a lateral? So yeah. there's a lot of culture. But you've spread this culture all around the world. I mean, you've, you've made, you, you've done more marketing than the American Dental Association. Well, okay, let's not say me. I, I was a conduit. I was, I was lucky. And, you know, it was ABC that really gave us the opportunity. But it, it was a great thing. It was a great thing for every dentist in the world. They estimated that as a result of shows like Extreme Makeover, cosmetic dentistry increased by 30% worldwide. So it, it did make a big impact. And, you know, it, it was a time when, you know, we got to go on Larry King Live. You know, I mean, I grew up watching Larry King as a kid. You know, and here I am in his studio where, you know, the, the segment before me had three of the most powerful world leaders. And here I am with, the, you know, the Extreme Makeover team. So it was kind of crazy. I'm like sitting here going, wow, I'm just a dentist. And, you know, here I am. But it, it made a big impact. And it gave people an opportunity to say, you know what? It's okay not to like your smile. Go fix it. And it's not that hard to do. So it, it just opened a lot of doors. 
You know, the uh, first 10 years I listened to Larry King, I, I, I couldn't have picked him out of a police lineup. I just remember laying in bed. I had that AM radio, and it had the FM dial, but there were no stations. And I just thought it was so cool to be laying in my basement in Wichita, Kansas, hearing this cool show all the way from New York City. And I just thought, yeah. what, what, a, what a technology to lay there in your basement listening to this guy talk to famous people in New York City. I, I think it was at least 10 years uh, before I ever... Uh, saw him on TV or anything like that. So, Bill, when you um, when you look at the podcast data, it's uh, it's they're, they're they're younger kids, and th this show is um, they're juniors and seniors in dental school. Almost all of them are under thirty, so they're coming out of school and they're looking at you, the top dog, the top cosmetic dentist, Beverly Hills. Um, how can they become a cosmetic dentist? Details, steps. Where would they go to learn? What should they do? Are there books? Are there courses? Institutes? How do, how do you, if someone wanted to do the work you do on um, famous people that are going to be under the limelight, how, how do they learn these skills? Okay, you just asked me like 20 questions. It was 28. <laughs> okay. So, all right. Let, let's, let's My back. questions are so bad, I throw like 25 out there and hoping one of them's good. One of them sticks. Okay. <laughs> so let's back up a little bit. Um, First of all, cosmetic dentistry was my niche. You know, you can have a great career in pedo, in endo, in perio, in just doing implants, in ortho. I mean, so cosmetic dentistry is just a niche that, that I really, you know, related to. But, man, I've seen some incredibly successful doctors. I know a guy in, in, in Tennessee that's got six or seven pedo clinics. And, and this guy makes like $10 million a year. I mean, it's crazy. So there's a lot of different ways to be successful in dentistry today. The, the thing is, I, I teach a program and it, it's called LEAP. It, it's a motivational leadership program. We do this every summer. It's a nonprofit. The students are age 15 to 25. And we basically teach, in fact, I brought a brochure here to show you. We basically teach kids the skills that they need to be successful in life. And the two things that I like to pound into their heads, and this is what I'm going to give you for your dental students and everybody else watching. Number one, don't wait for opportunities in life. Make them. You can sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait forever and nothing will happen. The biggest things that happened in my life, in my career, happened because of input that I did in making them happen. And I can go back and tell you, you know, how I prepared myself for Extreme Makeover before it even happened. You know, I was married to an actress. I was doing stuff on TV. She had a demo reel. I thought, I'm going to make a demo reel. I made the demo reel. I had this demo reel. When ABC reached out to me, they talked to like, I don't know, a hundred different dentists. I was the only one with the demo reel. I was the only one that could show them, hey, I've been on TV. You should use me. You know, so those kinds of things prepare you. The second thing I like to really try and pound into their heads is this. When you do get an opportunity, don't take it. Master it. And that's a big difference. When I got on Extreme Makeover and I saw what a huge impact that had on our company, on sales, on dentistry, on, 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 I said, I need to be the best I can be on this. I wasn't great in the beginning. I, I mean, uh, the first few episodes, I looked like a deer in headlights. But what I did was I took acting classes, hosting classes, teleprompting classes, and I hired a media trainer and that woman sat there and just, she just like nailed me. She turned this way, looked this way. I mean, she worked with me and worked with me and worked with me to try and make me the best I could be so that when I was doing this stuff, I was really a lot more comfortable at it. I was rehearsed. You know, it's like practice. Remember the first time you cut a crown prep in dental school? It took you what, like four hours, right? Now you can cut a crown prep in five minutes because you've practiced for years and years and years, you know, and practice makes perfect, you know? So she just, she asked, she put me in interview situations. She asked me questions. She, I mean, over and filmed it and let me watch myself and see how bad I was and then gave me pointers. So number one, make opportunities. Number two, don't take them, master them. 
And when these kids are going to walk out of school, I mean, their, their training curriculum was in algebra and calculus and trig and physics and everything you're talking about doesn't even talk about what they were, what they were trained in. That's right. So what they should do is exactly what you did. Find a mentor. You came to my office and you watched me work. When I graduated dental school, I went to Switzerland. I worked in a Swiss dental clinic for two years. That clinic took one dentist a year out of the U.S. They had 400 applicants. You want to know why I got hired, Howard? I called that guy every week. Every week. I sent a letter of recommendation from every single professor in my university who knew me. I asked him to write a letter. I didn't ask. I said, you know what? I'll write the letter. Can you just personalize it? That way you get a really good letter. And I <laughs> sent him about 20 letters. And when I realized that I probably had a snowball's chance in hell of getting into that clinic, I called the guy up one day and just said, hey, can I take you to lunch? He said, I'm in Switzerland. You're in San Francisco. I said, that's fine. I'll fly there. Now, the funny thing was I was broke. I didn't have a penny. I grew up poor. I had to literally take out a loan to buy an airplane ticket to go to Switzerland and meet this guy. And he hired me because I was the only one who did that, Howard. I came back. I researched and I found the five most successful dentists in Beverly Hills because I knew that's where I wanted to practice. And I called them up and I said, look, I'm a stupid dental student. I don't know anything. I don't know anybody. And I hear you're the greatest dentist in the world. Can I come and sit in and watch you work? And I did. And I sat there like a sponge and I just took notes and took notes. And I interviewed the women in the office and I interviewed the assistants. And I wanted to know all the good things that they were doing. And what I did is I took all of those things and then I put them into my practice. And I found great mentors. And I always ask, that's one of the things at LEAP that we say all the time, don't reinvent mediocrity, copy genius. And so one of the things I do with the students in this program is I try and get them to find great mentors in their life. Because somebody who's doing it the right way, it's so much easier to copy that than to try and figure it out from the get-go, right? Uh, amazing story. Where were you born and raised? Were you born and raised in Beverly Hills? No, no. I was poor, Howard. I, we were, we grew up in the Valley. I, I was a Valley kid. I, I grew up in Granada Hills. In fact, there were two famous people that graduated my high school, John Elway and Valerie Bertinelli. And ironically, Valerie Bertinelli went on a show called One Day at a Time. And my roommate in dental school, who's still my best friend's father, was Pat Harrington, who just passed away, and he was on the show with Valerie. So I grew up in this little, tiny, you know, Granada Hills, and uh, went to UCLA, San Francisco. I went to UOP Dental School, and um, after that, off to Switzerland for two years, and then back to Beverly Hills. I know you're a phenomenal athlete. Did you ever play uh, football with John Elway? Did he uh, yeah, I did, actually. <laughs> well, John and my brother were best friends. And so we would play street football. And I'm not going to lie. You could go to the end of the block. And that guy would hit, it, it, he would hit you so hard in the chest, I, you would have welts. He would literally knock you over. I didn't even want to play with him. It hurt too bad. He was amazing. And I'll tell you something. He was a better baseball player than football player. Really? Like, he played football because he made a deal with Stanford that his dad would coach. Really? Remember, his father was the coach of the team. Wow, that is amazing. So, so um, go back in the journey um, before you uh, discus dental. A lot, a lot of the dentists my age uh, remember you as uh, discus dental with all these uh, bleaching. And they remember you as a speaker there. Right, you used to have some amazing Las Vegas uh, shows. Well, oh, how, how, how did how did you ever get? Um, tell us a discus story. What was that about? So discus dental. Um, you know, one of the things I found in my life, Howard, is that every time I genuinely wanted to give back philanthropically, it ended up paying off for me in spades. Uh, inadvertently. I mean, it wasn't like I said, I need to do this because I'll make it, 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 it was just crazy. And discus is probably the best example. 
here I am at the gym working out, Sports Club LA, it's now in Equinox. And this woman came up to me, I remember her name. I remember that, I remember, there will be moments in your life that are just defining moments that you will never, ever, ever forget. And this was one of them. This tall, beautiful, blonde woman walks up to me. Her name was Cynthia Hearn. She says, would you like to help raise money for children's cancer research? I said, absolutely, that would be amazing. I said, what, what would you like me to do? She goes, well, you, you are a dentist, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. She goes, and you're single, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, but what does that have to do with anything? She goes, well, we're having a bachelor auction. We're going to auction off 10 bachelors to a thousand women. Would you like to be there? I'm like, yes. <laughs> what do I have to do? Now, the bachelor auction was actually kind of silly and the whole thing was, was, but it raised money. But the important thing that came out of it was the guy standing in line right in front of me was a man named Robert Heyman, who you know. And Robert was the son of Fred Heyman, who created Beverly Hills, Giorgio, 273, I mean, on and on and on. And Robert grew up in the cosmetic industry and new marketing. He had an MBA and new business. And together, well, first of all, Robert and I became best friends. And together, we built this company, Discus Dental. And we decided to manufacture and market tooth whitening in a way that had never been done before. Instead of doing it as you know, a, a, a medical dental product, we did it as a cosmetic. We did it with beautiful models, with nice packaging, like a cosmetic. And it caught on. And we taught dentists how to sell in their practice because dentists didn't know how to sell. In fact, they thought it was bad at first. And we convinced them that it wasn't. And we would go out and we would train them. And it was an amazing, amazing experience. And, you know, the first year we did 2 million in sales, 4 million, 8 million, 16 million, and grew and grew and grew. At about 16 million, I realized this is a real business. And you're an <laughs> idiot for not knowing it. So what I did, Howard, is I went back to school. You remember that thing I said, don't take opportunities, you know, maximize them. I went back to school. And I started taking business classes, accounting classes, marketing classes at UCLA, because I didn't want to be in this company and not contributing the most I could. And so, you know, I learned the business. I learned how to run a business. I mean, at one point we had 650 employees and our business grew and grew and grew. And right at about 75 million, we just plateaued and we just couldn't break that barrier. There were Crest white strips and all these other products and whatnot. In 2003, Extreme Makeover started. And in that year, we went from 76 million in sales to 101. From 101 to 135, and from 135 to $176 million in sales. And I'll tell you something else that people don't know. When you watched Extreme Makeover, Every single person on that show got paid. The hairstylists, the plastic surgeons, the nutritionists, everybody except me. I was the only one that didn't get paid. And the reason I didn't get paid is because I made a deal with ABC. The very first show we did, I did three Zoom whitenings. And afterwards they said, well, you know, would you like us to compensate you? I said, you know what? I'm an owner in the company. It's not that big a deal. Then we got picked up for 22 episodes our first season. First patient, first season needed 20 veneers, 10 uppers, 10 lowers. I was charging $1,500 a tooth at the time. It was $30,000. I sent the invoice to ABC. They freaked out. <laughs> They're like, are you kidding? We didn't budget for this kind of money. I said, well, what do you want me to do? They said, well, can you do three veneers? I'm like, who picks, me or you? I'm like, no. I don't need every other two. I said, no, I'm not going to do three. She got three white teeth and 17 black ones. No. They said, well, we can't afford this. I said, I'll make you a deal. Another defining moment in my life. I'll do all the dentistry for free under the following conditions. Number one, you mentioned zoom whitening and highlight it in every episode. Done. Number two, I don't want to pay for all the lab bills. 
So you have to mention Da Vinci veneers in every single episode and put them in the rolling credits and let people know who did the, the lab work. They said, done. I said, number three, I'm the only dentist. They said, why? I said, because I don't want you to get some quacky guy on there that does a bad job and then people think that's me. And number two, I know dentists all over the world. When we're done with these people, I don't want their mouths to fall apart. Let me refer them to my friends and I'll find people that will at least do recalls on them and cover them for the next year. So we know it isn't like they come in, we fix them and then a year later, their mouths fall apart. They said, done. And that was it. And it was, it was, it was a really fortuitous, lucky moment. And, and I just did it like on the fly. It wasn't like I planned it out, but it ended up being one of the greatest business decisions I ever made. Wow, that is a heck of a story. So <clears throat> what happens along your journey where you say, you know what, I'd, I'd rather cash out, sell it to Phillips instead of keep it till you're 103? So here's the thing. I was working my butt off, Howard. I mean, this is another thing, you know, kids come to LEAP. By the way, if people want information on LEAP, let me just give you the website. It's www.leapfoundation.com. And it's crazy how many young kids come up to me and say, Dr. Bill, Dr. Bill, what's the secret of success? I'm like, it's like they want a pill, Howard. <laughs> I'm like, it's really easy. Work your butt off. They're like, really? I'm like, yeah, it's not a secret. You, every <laughs> successful person I know works like crazy. I mean, even the Kardashians, they work hard. I mean, I don't like what they do, and I'm not a big supporter. They work hard. I worked hard. Howard, I was doing dentistry probably a good 50 to 60 hours a week during the week, and then I was filming Extreme Makeover on the weekends, maybe like 12-hour days, because I couldn't do that and have patients in the office at the same time. You know, imagine if it, you know, Anthony Hopkins walks in and there's a camera crew. I mean, they, my patients don't want to be on TV, except when they want to be on TV, right? So I had to, you know, do this on the side, but it was a lot of work. And when it got to a point where our sales were strong enough that I knew if I sold that company, I would never have to work again the rest of my life unless I wanted to, that was the time to sell. Because you never know. I mean, hypothetically, if somebody makes a pill that you swallow and your teeth become white, what's the value of my company? Nothing. You know, I mean, we had a great ride. It was a great, great experience. But I think one of the smart things to learn in life is when enough is enough. You know, there's a reason why Michael Jordan retired. You know, he had the greatest career. And the night he retired was probably the greatest game of his life but enough is enough and you got to know when your endpoint is because sometimes if you wait too long you lose that opportunity you know if another company had come around that was better or different whatever the value of my company wouldn't have been what it was so the timing was right things were right we did it and where where's phillips based out of and why did you go with phillips well Phillips bought our company and moved. Their headquarters are in Holland. I haven't done a lot with them since they sold the company. You know, they, they call me on as a spokesperson periodically, and I still use all their products, but they moved the headquarters. They, they, they changed everything. We have very few employees that are still working, you know, with Phillips uh, since the sale of the company. So... I, I just get called in periodically for special projects. Bill, when you're working with kids, how much of their success do you think is just hardwired versus learned? I, I guess the point is making a, you know, sometimes you see someone like Trump who gets a big inheritance and makes it a lot bigger. Um, another one was the uh, founder of CNN. He inherited a media company from his father, but he turned it into CNN. Uh, some kids you know, crawl out of the ghetto and make it to the top. Um, right. how, mu how much of these kids' success is, uh, you know, they, they got a helping hand versus 
they were hardwired and how much of failures they are born broken. I mean, when, you know, when, that that's a hard, it's hard, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. And each kid is different, but, but here's the thing. The thing I love about Lee is that, you know, we teach these kids the secret to success. We teach these kids the things that we know successful people have done for years and years and years. And we try to help give them what we say is a, a seven year head start on success, you know, and it's always going to take hard work. And, you know, a lot of times it's, it's also building self-confidence. This is one of the first things I do with the kids at LEAP. And, and, and this exercise really kind of opens up the, the door for the whole program. When you woke up this morning, whether you thought you did this or not, you did this. You put a number on your head. One's the lowest, ten's the highest. What I do is I look at the students and I say, how many of you woke up this morning and didn't put a 10 on your head? I said, raise your hand. So you, you see the kids that haven't been to leap yet raising their hands. And then I look and I say, who picked the number? You. Why would you pick anything less than a 10? I said, wipe it off and put a 10 on there. I said, wake up and be a 10. Act like a 10. Walk like a 10. Talk like a 10. And by the way, surround yourself with other kids that are 10s. Because if you want to be a 10 and all your friends are twos, it lowers your average. You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And if you're hanging out with, you know, druggies and drunks and party animals, really, how are you going to be successful? And one of the things I do at LEAP is I really try and have the kids sit down and write out a list of all their friends and basically eliminate all the ones that are bad influences on them. So a lot of kids are listening to this right now and they work in a corporate dental office and they can't stand their job. And they, they want to someday own their big dental office. And I talk to bankers and they say, these guys have access to lo uh, loans. They can get them financed, especially if they're buying an existing dental office with a cash flow. But, but bottom, day, bottom line, Dr. Bill, they're scared. What, what would you tell this, uh, this lady commuting to work right now? She's 27 years old. She's been working in a chain for two years. She, she wants to pull the trigger, but she's, ah. You know, Howard, I was in that exact same position. 1986, I came back from Switzerland. I worked with one of the most successful cosmetic dentists in, in Century City. I watched this guy. And like I said, I, I looked at about a lot of other practices. The plan was, his name was Howard um, and um, Hoffman. And I was going to work in his office for two years and then buy his office. Two years go by, we draft up the, the merger documents. Everything's all done. All he has to do is sign it. He looks me in the eye. He says, Bill, I can't do it. He goes, I just... I'm not ready to retire. He goes, I'm sorry. I, he goes, I, I, I just, I can't do it. And the timing was great. There was a guy named Sherwin Davidson right next door to me who just left the building. So there was a suite all built out. There was no equipment, but it was all built out. There was a dentist two stories up for me who had a, an unfortunate accident, passed away. She had a whole dental office full of equipment. I went up there and I looked at it. Um, I had it, I, I had it evaluated um, by um, Patterson and they said it, it was about, you know, $100,000 worth of dental equipment. Um, I went to the, the, the owner of my building. I said, I'll give you $3,000 for all that equipment and I'll clean the space up. He said, great, take it. So I took all that equipment. I put that into the suite next door. I opened up my, my shingle on the door and away I went. And uh, Jennifer D. St. George. Um, was a was lecturing a lot at the time and she was doing practice management and I called her up She said you got to call this guy and this guy and this guy and I set it up and she said, you know Try and take out a loan. I said, yeah, but what happens if I if I can't make payments? She goes, so what? You're going to debt. She goes, no, he's gonna put you in jail for that. I'm like that. That's true And my I never forget my first month in practice I made $18,000 and I was like on cloud nine, 
I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And, um, and, and I needed patience. I needed patience desperately. Now, this was before 9-11, so it was easy to go into buildings. It wasn't like now where you have to go through security and this and that. And for $300, I made up all these flyers, you know, come in and, you know, get your teeth clean. Well, I don't know. I gave them some incredible offer for like 50 bucks. First month in practice, I got 80 new patients. The second month, I got 150 new patients. And we just kept doing that. And I literally filled my practice with all these patients. And um, at the time, I was dating a young woman that worked at William Morris. And so she started sending me some celebrities. And I mean, it just kind of snowballed and grew and grew. So my advice is find a great mentor. If you're not happy doing what you're doing, there's still a lot of great opportunity in dentistry. Sam Sarabi, young kid. I, 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 I mentored this kid all the way through dental school, right? Went out, opened up 15 practices in the Dallas area. He's killing it. And he doesn't have to charge his patients anything. They're all government subsidized because he treats kids. I mean, there are a lot of niches in dentistry that you can find. Stop sitting around, stop complaining, stop feeling sorry for yourself, go out and do something. That's my advice. Phenomenal advice. So, Sams, how do you spell Sam Sarabi? S A A M Zarabi, Z A R A B I. He's amazing. And he's hired a lot. He's got, I don't know, he's got something like 400 employees now. This kid's killing Is it. Is he a friend of yours? Uh, he's like a brother. Will you, will you send him an email and CC me, Howard at dentaltown.com? I'd love to have him on the show. I would love to have you talk to him. You would love him. He is such an amazing bundle of energy. And this kid is, you know what he did, Howard? In Texas, the government pays for pediatric dental care, right? Because they have so much oil money, right? Right. Most of the clinics are really bad, dirty. He built beautiful little boutique clinics all over Texas, you know, and it wasn't really expensive, but he used bright colors and he put in like the little McDonald's jungle gym sets and put beautiful big decals up on the wall and things like that. And they're just, they're, they're pretty. And the, the patients come in, they get good care in a clean office. And he runs his office in a different way than private practices. You know, I have, let's say eight patients scheduled for the day, right? They know that they're going to have about 30% no show, right? So basically they overbook by 30%. And it's kind of like super cuts. Like you go in, he cuts your hair, she cuts your, and it's just as the patients come in, a dentist and one person oversees the treatment plan and they get it done. And these patients get great care and it works. But Bill, but back to your specific uh, expertise, cosmetic dentistry, what would you recommend to that young kid? He says, where would I learn this? Where, where would I learn how to do what you're doing on Extreme Makeover? All right, so there's two places that I always tell dentists they need to go. Number one, you need to go to the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry. Next year's meeting, I think, is in May. It will be in Vegas, easy to get to. I literally grew up at the AACD. That is where I learned how to do cosmetic dentistry and continue to learn how to do cosmetic dentistry. The other place I love to go every year is the Crown Council. The Crown Council isn't about dentistry, it's about team building and philanthropy. We've gone on humanitarian trips all over the world. I've taken my kids to Africa, to Asia, to, uh, to, to Latin America. And in fact, we even built a dental clinic in the Dominican Republic. And you know, parents always say like, you know, what's the best way to really teach my kids, you know, philanthropy? You don't teach it, you do it. You can tell your kids whatever you want. What they're really gonna learn is what they see. So if you, my kids since the age of five have been going all over the world with me, working with me in all of these you know, different places and actually doing the mission trips with me. 
And that's how you teach a child philanthropy. You have them do it with you. On Dental Town, a lot of threads are stressed about the patient interaction. And, you know, it's kind of like, is the dog wagging the tail, the tail wagging the dog? And so many of the questions are, um, you can tell the stress is not actually doing the dentistry. It's dealing with the patient. You deal with some very high maintenance people. I mean, you're, you're, you're dealing with, uh, um, you, you have probably dealt with people with higher expectations and bigger egos than anyone who ever ran a dental office in Wichita, Kansas. Um, any tips on how to manage patients? I think the best thing is, you know, people always talk about communicating, communicating, communicating. Stop communicating. Connect. Big difference. When you're talking with somebody, yeah, you're communicating. When you connect with somebody, it's a completely different thing. And you need to learn how to connect with your patients. Number one, I always tell my patients, what I'm telling you is what I would tell my mother or my father or my best friend or my kid or my, my spouse. I mean, I'm treating you the way I would treat myself after 30 years of dentistry. And this is what I would do. And you will get patients that absolutely don't want to follow your advice. And my advice to you is don't treat them. I mean, I have literally told people, look, this is what you need to do. And they're like, well, I don't want to do ortho be before I do my veneers. I just want veneers. I'm like, your teeth are like this, okay? I can't put veneers on them. I'm not going to do a bad job. You have to do ortho if you want veneers. Otherwise, you should just walk around with your teeth like this because I can't do a good job. And they know when you're not being honest. They have that BS meter. And the second you start BSing people, they know it. You know, you need to be completely honest. And I know it's hard for us a lot of times because it's like, okay, you sit down and here's your ideal treatment plan. And the patient's like, okay, doc, that's great, but I don't have $30,000, you know? Well, what, you know, and that's where I have the most amazing treatment coordinator, Sinet. This woman is gold. She's gold. And she walks in the room and she will literally say to a patient, okay, how much can you actually spend on your teeth? And they'll say, 10,000. I can spend 10,000. She's like, give me a minute. She'll come out, we'll sit down and we'll talk and we'll make a plan where, yeah, they can spend 10,000 now. And then maybe next year, another five or 10,000. We'll basically make a long-term plan. And sometimes it might take a few years to get there, but at least we're moving in the right direction. Or it becomes one of these things where, you know, somebody sits down, they don't know what things cost. And like, you know, I'm going to lose all my teeth. I want implants. But they don't understand that, you know, you're, to do a whole mouth restoration with implants is going to cost them sixty or $70,000, right? But they can afford dentures. And you can always add implants later as long as they don't wait too long and they still have bone. So it's really trying to come up with a treatment plan that they can afford at the time and work with them and, you know, give them a long-term goal. So Bill, you've been doing dentistry for what, three decades? 31 years, Howard. 31 years. What would you say is the state of dentistry today versus three decades ago? Point being, a lot of these kids come out of dental school and they say, Howard, Bill, you graduated in the golden years. We're coming out with corporate dentistry and, uh, you know, you know, stagnant economy, America lost 50 million, blah, blah, blah. Do you think dentistry is still the opportunity it is today for today's 2016 graduates as it was when you got out three decades ago? You know, it, it's funny. When I graduated dental school and I started working, Delta Dental paid $1,500 a year. Today, 31 years later, Delta Dental pays $1,500. <laughs> Dental insurance is a joke. There really isn't any dental insurance. I mean, maybe it covers cleanings. That's it. So, you know, that's not viable. But there are other things. You know, there are patient financing. 
you know, and people that want to finance their dentistry can do it through different, you know, avenues. I mean, there are great opportunities in dentistry. You know, I know people that do really well in doing sleep apnea. I know people that do well in, a, in, in I mean, Grant Lusfeld, who's been in my practice for 15 years, he started taking implant courses about 10 years ago. He's doing probably close to a million dollars a year just in implants alone in our practice. So there are opportunities, but you got to work hard. You know, I mean, I went to the gym yesterday. I got two new patients. I went to the gym today. I got another new patient. I get at least 75 new patients a month. Word of mouth, all these things. The young associates that come into my practice bring no new patients. They're waiting there for us to give them patients. I don't get it. It's like the whole millennial frame of mind doesn't really make sense to me. You've got to work hard. You've got to go out. You got to do all the same things that we did, Howard. Join the Rotary Club, meet people. Don't communicate, connect with them. You know, everybody needs a dentist. And today still, 50% of the people out there don't have a dentist. So I don't understand why they're bitching and complaining. There are patients out there. Give them your card and bring them in your office. It's that entitlement mentality. Bill, it, we, we put, uh, so Dental Town's got 215,000 members. We came out with the phone app and uh, it's up to 50,000 members. It gets 1,000 new dentists. But we started this online CE. We put 350 courses up. They've been viewed over uh, 600,000 times. It would be so unbelievably awesome, amazing, wow. Uh, you'd validate our whole CE section if you'd put a course on there for us. Do you think there's any chance Someday you would grace our website with an online CE course from the man himself. Yeah, so tell me what that entails, because I don't like to commit to something. Just like, whatever. I mean, everybody does their course different. Some, uh, uh, I'm Howard at Dental Town, the guy that does online CE. When you CE. say a course, what is that? A series of several lectures? No, it's just a uh, well, one hour course. Uh, some people just uh, uh, do uh, put, upload the PowerPoints and do a voiceover. Some people submit an hour video. Some people, uh, Carl. Carl Mischus. Well, isn't this a course right here? Uh, well, this is a podcast. This is more of a multitasking. Uh, this is what I do. I'm Howard at Dental Town. I do the podcast. This is a multitasking behavior. They're all commuting to work right now, or they're on the treadmill or the Stairmaster. The online CE, yeah, we have to get it approved by the, they, they want um, CE credits, um, you know, that's uh, approved by the ADA, the AGD. Right. Uh, it, it's just, a, it, it's really the same, but it's a different behavior. But it would be so damn cool to have a course up there from the man. Really? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, right. I, I watched you, dude. I stood over your shoulder for a day or two days. I, 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 I don't even know how long I was down there. I mean, it was just, it was just amazing. And what I was, your office ran like a Swiss clock. But I thought what would have been equally stressful is dealing with these beautiful women who had high expectations. I mean, I would have said no to every case you touch just because, you know, I, I, I'd rather do, I, I'd rather put a flipper in an old fat bald guy than take someone who's already a 10 and her teeth already look perfect to me and she wants them more perfect. I, I thought your kahunas dragged on the sidewalk when you walked to take on these cases. Then to have a camera over your shoulder and put them on ABC, I mean, it, I, I was blown away. Seriously, dude, you, you are out there. All right, sure. I'll do, I'll do a course for you. But I mean, seriously, I mean, and, and, yeah, that was, I mean, I was blown away. I, I, I could never do what you do. I mean, and I, I bet you 99% of the dentists on earth could never do what you do. I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'll do your course if you help me with something. Okay. I bet it has to do with Lee. Help me get the word out about Lee. I, this is something I'm so passionate about, you know. I really feel that my lot in life here is just to make the world a better place. And I know that these kids going through this course end up being better people, happier lives, more successful. I mean, it's amazing. And I personally fund this program to the tune of over $500,000 I put into this program to make it. So I'm not making any money on this. This is a this is a 501c3. It's a nonprofit. 
We, we get donations every year to help fund it. I'm the biggest donor to the program, but we will get 500 amazing kids at the program. And by the way, if you have any of your boys that you wanna send down to the program, it's the last week of July. It's July 24th to the 30th at UCLA. The students are age 15 to 25. I get the best, best, best speakers in, in the world on the college circuit come. Plus a bunch of my really cool celebrities. Last year I had Michael Strahan. I had um, Apollo Ono, the most decorated Olympic athlete in the world. And I had uh, Paula Abdul. Um, this year I think I'm gonna get Jennifer Lawrence and um, uh, I'm talking to a few others. So it, it's a phenomenal program. And these kids come out of this program with so much confidence and so many gifts you know, and, and mentors. Every single kid that walks out of that program, Friday is a mentor workshop where I would love if you could come to our Friday and I have a hundred professionals sitting at tables and it's like speed dating. The kids just sit there and ask questions, ask questions, ask, and then every 30 minutes we rotate. And it's going to be open this year by my good friend, um, Eric Garcetti, who's the mayor of Los Angeles. So it's, it's a really cool, cool program. So I will do your your continuing education program. And I would ask you in exchange that you help me get the word out and, um, and, and help us find dentists, you know, who want to send their kids to the program or, or just help us find students that want to come to the program. I will absolutely do that. I'll have our, uh, one of our editorial team members uh, call you up and arrange an interview on this. Um, the website is uh, leapfoundation.com. Um, is this also in part of the Crown Council? Or are they involved with this too? Not, no, they're not. Um, I originally started the program with Steve Anderson. So Walter Haley and Steve Anderson started a program years ago, and they asked me to come and be a mentor at the program for years, and I did. And then you remember Walter passed away 12 years ago. And so the program kind of went dormant. And then I revamped it with Steve and brought it back as a nonprofit, and we renamed it Leap. Why don't you get Steve to uh, come on this show and talk about it some more? Uh, Steve would love to come on the show. Yeah, Please. yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. He, he's the founder of the Crown Council. Yeah, Steve and his brother. Greg. Uh, Steve, Steve and Walter and Greg run the Crown Council. Steve, Walter, Greg, and Walter, uh, Walter, Walter Haley. Halfway. And the right. fact that you knew it was 12 years ago, that, that, that's, that's coming from pain for you to remember that it was 12 years ago. I mean, I remember my dad died 16 years ago. I think that's the only guy I know where I can tell you how many years ago he died. But yeah. that, must, that came from pain to remember 12. Is that right? Yeah, it was sad. Yeah, yeah I, I remember that day. I, I remember, yeah, that was a very sad uh, deal. Um, so what's the website for the Crown Council? Is it just thecrowncouncil.com? Um, it's crowncouncil.org. Crowncouncil.org. That's in uh, Salt Lake? Right. Their headquarters are in Salt Lake. Crowncouncil.org. Uh, yeah, I'd love to have and, – and Steve's the uh, CEO or president. What's, what's Greg? Um, you know, Steve and his brother Greg run the Crown Council, so I don't know what their exact titles are, but they run it together, and they put on – an amazing program every year. They don't have any dentists lecturing. It's all about team building and 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 a lot of it on philanthropy. And and uh, last thing I, I got you. Uh, you promised me one hour. I'm at 54 minutes. I only got six more minutes. Oh, I got time, Howard. Bill, um, to me, watching you for uh, three decades, it seems like a lot of your energy comes from your commitment to physical fitness. I see that you're on the cover of a magazine this month. Pick up that magazine and show them. I mean, what is that even called? You're hanging on the side of a bar, sticking <laughs> your body out. It's called a, Holy it's a, a, a flag. It's called a flag? Yeah. And I'm not hanging like this. I'm literally horizontal like that. That's crazy. What would, what would you say, Bill? We're in a profession where 18% of dentists during their career will go to inpatient treatment for three or four months. For substance abuse, it's about 85% alcohol, 15% pills, um, lots of stress. They've had high suicide rates. How important do you think, do you think you could have been as successful as you are if you would have let yourself go? No way. You know, it's funny, Howard. I've always been an athlete. You know, I, I was a gymnast and a swimmer in, in, in high school and college. And when I started dental school, 
uh, I started getting these horrible pains in my neck and my, in, in my, in my back. And I realized that, you know, I needed to exercise. And the more I exercised, the better I felt. And so I started getting into better and better shape. And I realized that when I did that, I could practice dentistry all day and not have a stiff neck and not be sore. So as I, you know, learned more about fitness and exercise, I actually felt better. I ate better, you know, I, and, and now I'm, I'm only doing dentistry 20 hours a week. So I'm actually in better shape today than I was when I was in my 20s because I have more time to work out. But I would say no matter how busy I was, even when I was, you know, working, you know, 50 or 60 hours a week as a dentist, I still went to the gym every other day. I always made time for it. And even with all my lecturing and everything, and when I was a road warrior and I was traveling all over the place, I made time to go to the gym. I may not have seen every site in Paris or Rome or whatever, but I went to the gym because I knew if I didn't keep that up, my career as a dentist was not going to last. I think you're the most physical fit dentist I've ever met. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean Actually, do, you know, do you know a dentist that can do the flag? No, actually, this I'm, I'm, there's a contest right now called the Ultimate Guy with Men's Health, and I'm actually in the finalist to be on the cover of Men's Health magazine. This was the uh, the article that they wrote um, in this journal. Wow! Fido for the celebrity for this celebrity dentist, who was that celebrity dentist? That's me. That was you. Yeah. Put it back I, up. I, that's me. Well, your hair looks very different. No, no it doesn't. No, huh, amazing. It's it, the same. I, Howard, I have hair. Okay, that, that's where uh, I'm getting thrown off. So that, that is amazing. I mean, you, you excel in everything. I mean, you raise to the top in physical fitness and finance and business and marketing. I mean, really, you're a legend in so many different ways. No, nah, I just try really hard, Howard. I really do. I mean, it's, it's not easy. And you know, the, the thing is people always say, you're so successful, you know? I mean, m m my take on success is this, I refuse to fail, so I never do. And, and, I, and I'm not saying that in, in arrogance, I'm saying it because you only fail when you quit or give up. See, if I do something and it doesn't come out the way I want it to, I don't call that failure. I call that practice. And then I do it again. And if it didn't come out the way I wanted, it was more practice. And I'll do it again and again and again and again and again and again and again until eventually it happens the way I want and then it's success. So I didn't really fail. I may have practiced a lot, but I'm not gonna call that failure. I'm gonna call that practice. And so, you know, people say, well, Bill, you're so successful it's because I refuse to fail. I just won't. If something really means a lot to me, I will make sure that I can figure out a way to make it happen. It may not happen right away and it may not be easy, but I'm not going to give up. And that's the difference. Okay. And that's our hour. So give my homies, you're talking to thousands of dentists, give them a call to action. What do you want them to do? You want them to go to www.leapfoundation.com and do what? and sign up any 15 to 25 year olds that you think could benefit from the program. It's a nonprofit motivational leadership program for high school and college students. And literally, I think it's the best one in the world. I haven't seen one that even comes close. And it's in LA? It's in Los Angeles, it's for one week. The tuition covers everything, the, the room, the, the, the food, the everything, everything that goes on the program is all covered under the tuition. It's in LA, July 24th to 30th, and it, it's an amazing program. And they will get, they will, they'll, they'll gain friends for life. Would you fly into LAX or, um, or the yeah, we fly into LAX and we pick you up? And, and, we, and what's the week tuition cost? Um, it's about $2,800 for the whole week. $2,800. Uh, seriously, dude, thank you for letting me come and watch you uh, three decades ago. Uh, thank you for all that you've done for me personally. Thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. Thank you for elevating cosmetic dentistry around the world. 
Uh, you are a legend around the world. You're definitely a legend to me and my boys. Thank you for spending an hour with me on Memorial Day. No, thank you, Howard. Thanks for the opportunity and thanks for all your support. You were always very gracious with us. You always showed up and did a great job at our programs and uh, you have been a legend yourself. Would you say you'll ever speak at one of our meetings someday? I've never said no to you. All you have to do is invite me. All Everybody right. All right. Me, I come. Oh. I've never said no to you, Howard. All right, buddy. Thanks right. a lot. All right. And, thank, and thanks to Ryan for working on Memorial Day. Yeah, thanks, Ryan.